thank you everyone for being here. I know this is a highly watched topic. And we're going to just come as some initial ground rules. I know there's a lot of people and a lot of questions to get to. What we're going to start with is the governor is going to kick things off. The Senate Majority Leader and the House Speaker are both going to talk, and then we're going to actually hear from the other folks um, who represent different unions here who are going to talk as well. We anticipate that will take about roughly 15 minutes, and then we are going to turn it to questions from the audience. We are going to call on people because we know there's so many people here, and we're going to try and get to as many questions as possible. Um, then we also have reporters who are on the phone as well, too, so we're going to switch partway through to take a few calls on the line, and then we'll come back to close things up. We're gonna, we have to wrap everything up by about 11.45 because of pending session. Uh, so with that, I think Governor will turn it over, and we will be, our team, and we have also different members as well too that the Governor will explain a little bit here too, that we are here as a resource for you to help answer any follow-up questions. So don't worry about that. And with that, Governor Snyder. Thank you, Sarah. Well, first of all, Lieutenant Governor Kelly and I appreciate everyone coming together for this event. Um, this is an important day in Michigan. Uh, the topic today is workplace fairness and equality. Um, quite often people call it right to work, but I think it's a much better description to say this is about fairness in the workplace and equality in the workplace. I'm going to be fairly straightforward. I'm going to walk through three things. Um, what I'm asking for, and why, and why the timing. And then we're going to get comments from the Senate Majority Leader, the Speaker, and these fine people that are kind enough to join us today. So first of all, what am I asking for? I'm asking that we pass an act that calls for workplace fairness and equity, to be pro-worker, to give freedom of choice to our, the workplace, um, and that the legislators move promptly and efficiently in moving it through the legislature, and when it arrives on my desk, I plan on signing it. Um, we've had a lot of good discussions on this topic, healthy discussions, and I think this is what's best for Michigan. Um, in terms of the legislation itself, it will cover both the public and private sector. Um, there will be one carve-out exemption for police and fire, um, but it's fairly straightforward legislation. Now the why, which I think is critically important. This is all about taking care of the hardworking workers of Michigan, about being pro-worker, about giving them the freedom to choose who they associate with. I do not view this as something against the unions. I support the unions in many regards. I support their right to organize. This has nothing to do with collective bargaining. I continue to be an advocate for collective bargaining in Michigan. I've done it successfully twice with state employees. This has no impact on that. This has nothing to do with the relationship between employers and unions. This is about the relationship between unions and their workers or the workers in the workforce. And this is to give people the ability to choose and decide who they associate with. And one thing I do is I clearly encourage the unions to be proactive on this in a positive way. To the degree workers have the right to choose who they associate with, I encourage the unions to be very proactive about presenting the best case as to why someone should belong to a union. Because if you look at the history in Michigan, unions historically had done many good things in our state. And I encourage them to present the best case as to why someone would choose to join them in a positive, constructive way. The second reason to do this legislation is about having a healthy Michigan, about the comeback of Michigan in terms of more and better jobs. Um, if you looked at economic development activities in this country for some time, there's been a perception that has become a reality, that many businesses and organizations won't look at states that don't allow workers the freedom to choose. They essentially take us off the list of opportunities. And we've seen that many times here in the state of Michigan. Um, just recently, we were talking to a group of site selectors. Um, and not a scientific study, but just the feedback we got from them, they said about 25% of the opportunities that were presented to them to look at different states to set up is they excluded any state that didn't allow workers the freedom to choose. That's a huge loss of opportunity. Um, because we are showing progress in Michigan, and we need to keep that comeback coming. Um, now, let's, let me talk about the timing a little bit, because that's a question I'm sure you have on your minds. Um, because I've been very clear since 2009 that this was an issue that I didn't have on my agenda. Um, and I believe that was a very thoughtful and appropriate position to take back in 2009 that I've been very consistent with over the last two or three years. Um, the reason I didn't put it on my agenda is a couple fold. First of all, if you look at what group of workers in the state does this apply to, it's less than 20%. 
about 17.5% of workers in Michigan are unionized. Over 80% are not. So most workers, this is not a topic of even relevance to. And if you looked at where Michigan was at economically, there were much more important issues that affected all Michiganders. The need to reform our tax system, the need to balance our budget. There are many important things that were higher priorities in my view and we stayed focused on and we achieved. And it was also to create that environment of success. And I'm proud to say Michigan is the comeback state in the United States today. We have accomplished a lot of results by working together and being a team. Um, it is a divisive issue. It's an issue where you can see what's going on outside, that people have strong feelings on this topic. But we'd come to the point over the last few weeks and the last month or two where that issue was on the table whether I want it to be there or not. And given that it is on the table, I think it is appropriate to be a good leader and to stand up and take a position on this issue. Um, because the thing is, we should not let this fester. We should have a thoughtful discussion, which we've been doing. Let's move forward. Let's get a conclusion. Let's get an answer and get something done so we can move on to other important issues in our state um, in terms of looking at it in that context. The other thing that really drove this in terms of timing, in my view, was what Indiana did. I talked earlier about the issue about economic growth. The state of Indiana went to freedom to choose in February of this last year. Um, we've been watching the situation carefully. They've had a significant increase in business activity in terms of businesses that want to expand and grow in the state of Indiana. It's about more and better jobs. And just to give you a reference point, from the year 2001 to 2010, in the state of Michigan, we lost about three quarters of a million jobs in our state. Basically a lost decade of devastation. Since coming to office in 2011, as a team, we've worked hard. We've achieved over 141,000 new jobs in the state of Michigan in the last two years. We currently have a forecast for 2013 and 14 to add another 111,000 jobs. But my view is that's not good enough. My goal is to say by doing actions like this that make us more open to be pro-worker, that make it more encouraging to business, we can hopefully exceed even those numbers because we still have a big hole to get out of and we're making positive progress on that path. So to put in a simple summary, today is a day, um, given the dialogue, the discussion being on the table, it's time to step up, make some decisions. That's why I'm proud to be here with this group and my partners in the legislature, um, my partner in terms of the executive office, and these fine people to say, it's time for a call, and my call is asking for Workplace Equity and Fairness Act to be enacted in the next few days so we'll have a more effective Michigan, a brighter future, more and better jobs, and a future for our kids. So that's my simple position on this matter, and I'll look forward to your questions. I'm sure you'll have some when it comes around. But with that, um, let me turn it over to the speaker. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for joining us. Um, the people who literally work to build, grow, and make Michigan. Thank you. That's what this is about. This is about workplace fairness and equality, as the governor said. This is not about Republican versus Democrat. This is not about management versus labor. Uh, this does not change collective bargaining. This is not anti-union. It is pro-worker. This is about Michigan's hard workers. Michigan has the greatest workforce in the country. Our workers, our men and women, get up every day and go work hard every day to make, build, and grow our great state. They deserve the freedom to make decisions for themselves and their family. They deserve the freedom to decide which organizations they want to join, and which, which organizations they do not want to join. We're talking about fairness, we're talking about freedom, we're talking about equality. These are basic American rights. These are values that should unite us. They should not divide us. Our workers deserve to be able to have control of their decisions, their livelihoods, and their families. When this becomes the law of Michigan, unions will still be free to make their case, but now workers will be free to make their choice. It's my pleasure to be working very closely with everybody here 
and to be able to turn it over to my friend, the Senate Majority Leader, Randy Richardville. Thank you, Speaker Bolger, and thank you all for being here today. I'll keep my remarks relatively brief, which is not necessarily characteristic of me. Uh, but this is an issue that we've been wrestling with for a long time. It's not something that we've put on the table at the last minute, but it's something that my caucus, a caucus of 26 members, which is the biggest in history, um, has deliberated on a, a wide spectrum of views. And we have come together and believe that this is the time uh, that we look at this issue, tackle this issue, bring it up for a vote, and do something about it. Most of you probably don't know that uh, I come from a union household. And I'm probably, when you look at uh, conservatives or Republicans, uh, a little more supportive of the collective bargaining process than most. Some of the votes I've taken in my career include voting against mandatory seat belts, voting against mandatory helmets for motorcycle riders, voting against eliminating smoking in restaurants or bars that an owner would like to have that uh, happen for his or her customer base. I believe that we are in a, a country and a state where freedom is important. Now, I always put a seat belt on. If I rode a motorcycle, I'd always wear a helmet, and I don't smoke in bars or restaurants. But I'm given the choice to do that. And that's what's important for me is the choice. And here, if I had the opportunity to join a union and I was a worker in the state of Michigan, I know the value of being a, a member of a union. Whether it's pension planning, long-term planning, negotiating for benefits, eliminating uh, folks that aren't working from the, uh, from the, uh, the union, uh, the training and uh, education that unions provide for their members makes it a great investment, I believe, for most people in most unions. But I'm looking at the worker, the individual uh, man or woman who's a hardworking person with the kind of values that we have here in the state of Michigan. And I say, if I were you, I'd join that union. But I think it would be wrong if you didn't have a choice to not join the union. So for me, this is about that worker and the freedom for him or her to choose who represents or doesn't represent them. Thank you. Well, thank you both of you for the statements and the partnership we've had in going through this issue. Um, we also, as I mentioned, we have a number of people, rural Michigan workers with us, and I have, we have three sitting up here with me. Um, we also have a number on the, the side there. We figured we we're outnumbered today, so we have lots of good people to, for you to speak with um, when we're done with this session in terms of the press. Um, but what I'd like to do now is actually ask the, the three sitting with us to, to make a brief statement about who they are, their background, and how they feel about this issue. And to get it kicked off, we have Katie, Dave, and Terry with us. I'm going to turn it over to Katie. Hi. Uh, I'm Katie Meister. I'm an AFT member uh, down in Hamtramck. I'm a teacher. I have taught now for 32 years. My first 15 years teaching, I taught in Texas, a right to work state. I was in Houston, I had three different unions to choose from. During those 15 years, I was a union member, but I was a union member of the different unions of all three of them at different times based on what they offered me. The first year, it was the least expensive because I didn't make much money. I am currently a union member. I plan to stay a union member. I look forward to having choice in which union we might have. That is one of the reasons I am here today. I would like to have choice in our unions. Thank you. Okay. Dave? My name is Dave Toncray, uh, UAW, and I uh, work for Chrysler. And um, I've been at Chrysler for 13 years now. Um, I chose to take a union job at Chrysler. Before that, I worked as an electrician for a non-union shop. Um, previous to that, I, I worked in a right-to-work state as a non-union electrician and then chose to join the union for the same reasons. Uh, there was the benefits, and you know it, it served me well, and it does serve me well now, to be a union employee. I don't think this issue is anti-union at all. I will plan to continue be a union member. Um, but uh, I think um, what it will do is strengthen the union members' position within their union. Right now, I would say my union's pretty dysfunctional. And if I compare it to the IEB, IBEW that I belong to, they 
you know, they had to. They had to, they had to look out for me because I had a choice. And they had to respond to my needs and, and make sure that I was as happy as they could make me in order to keep me on board. And so uh, when I told the governor my story, he said, I think people want to hear it. So that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Terry? No, uh, no I, I, have a, I have a loud voice, so. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Terry Bowman. <clears throat> I'm a UAW member and have been for 16 years. Um, I've been a longtime advocate for the worker, for union workers, and I continue to do so. That is why I am here. You know, after studying this issue uh, very intensively, I have come to the conclusion that uh, freedom to work is really worker friendly. And uh, this is why I believe uh, and am so proud to be sitting here today. Um, you know, in a, in a state like Michigan currently, union officials, they don't really have to work very hard for their rank and file members. And the reason why is because they know that those members are forced as a condition of their employment to continue to support them. Um, when you introduce choice, when you introduce um, the, the ability for the worker to make the choice, uh, it's almost competition for the worker's loyalty. It, it makes union officials work harder for the union member. It makes union officials more answerable and accountable for the job that they do each and every day. And that is very pro-union worker. That is one of the greatest reasons why I am pro-freedom to work, is because it will make unions stronger in the long run. It gives workers that choice, and it makes workers better uh, uh, and um, uh, able to really express themselves in the workplace without fear. So uh, January 17th, 1962, Democrat President John F. Kennedy signed an executive order which gave federal employees, uh, says they shall have and shall be protected in the exercise of the right freely and without fear of penalty or reprisal to form, join, and assist in any employee organization or to refrain from any such activity. And that's really what this is about. It's about choice. It's about having the ability to just really refrain from it, that uh, such activity because we think that that will end up making unions stronger in the long run. So uh, it, to conclude, I just want to thank uh, everyone here for showing your courage and leadership on this issue. And um, I, I am uh, definitely proud and uh, thankful for all of you today. So thank you. Well, thank you, Terry. And I really appreciate the, the three comments. And you can see they're coming from their heart in terms of actually being supportive of unions and at the same time understand that this is about being pro-worker. So there is an important opportunity here to move forward. And again, that's where I am encouraging, actively encouraging, the passage of the Workplace Fairness and Equality Act. Can we get their spellings and their names? Yeah, we'll be happy to follow up with you on that, mm -hmm. Kyle, in terms of information. Um, so what we do now is uh, turn it over to Sarah to help moderate the questions, and uh, we'll look forward to the dialogue. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Just one second, please. We have for our media members who are on the line. Please press zero to ask your question. You'll get in the queue, and we'll get to you as soon as possible. We're going to take some questions from reporters first in the room. Um, and we'll, we'll do that here, and then we'll try and do it. If you raise your hand and just say for, the, for those who are watching and those who are listening on the phone, if you could just say your name and identify your outlet, even though that most of us know you. So for with that. Order, you'll get to legislators with questions. If we have time. Paul. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Governor, if the principle is freedom to choose, why exclude police and firefighters? Yeah, it's a fair question. One of the, the issues that we looked at is, is in particular, there's a, there's a history of the, the police and fire question that because of the very nature of their work, because you already see it in how we have legislation with Act 312, for example, with binding arbitration, um, it's a unique circumstance because of the dangerous nature of their work where it can be important that they have that special bond, that connection between them, um, that we thought it wasn't appropriate to move forward with um, that option at this point in time. So what I would say is it was just being conservative to look at it to say police and fire have a unique kind of relationship given the nature of their work. Um, we have Public Act 312 that has already identified that and we've been successful at for a number of years. So it just seemed appropriate to say let's not include that at this point in time. Can I, can I just say, Paul, that 312 binding arbitration will continue. 
Uh, instead of it changing, it will continue. And the constitutional uniqueness of the state police will continue. Uh, so the, those, that's the reason for the difference as well. All right. I saw Rick Eldon from the TDA next. Uh, particularly for the governor and the Senate Majority Leader, if your membership and if both of these houses had not pretty much brought this to the forefront, would you have been as anxious to deal with this right now, given the timing issue you talked about? I mean, I, clearly, this is being driven by your membership and the folks in the House and, and the legislature. Well, a couple things. It's not just the legislators. I would say the citizens have been speaking up on this issue much more actively in recent days. The other issue that I did mention, Rick, was Indiana. Um, Indiana did that in February, and we've been watching that carefully ever since that got enacted. Um, because if you look at it, in many respects, uh, if you go back to the old Michigan business tax, um, we lost a lot of business to Indiana because of the Michigan business tax. We got rid of that. Now we are competitive with Indiana, and we are actually being pretty successful. Um, Indiana did a thoughtful analysis. One governor that I've been clear that I have admired for many years was Governor Daniels. Um, and if you looked at it after they passed, we've tracked the data. We've been watching what the Indiana Economic Development Corporation's been doing. And they have identified 90 of their active opportunities that have literally come out and said that them passing legislation on this topic really encouraged them to do more business in Indiana, which would account for thousands of jobs potentially in their state. All right, and hang on, just again, for a reminder, for our media on the phone, you can press zero, and we will get in the queue to be able to ask a question when we get there in a few minutes. Senator, did you want to answer that? Oh, no, I thought they could Okay, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything. My apologies. Um, I saw Tim Skubik with multiple outlets. That would be on there. Good. <laughs> uh, Governor, if this is the right thing to do, why did it take you three years to get here? Well, again, I don't think I've changed course at all. I think it got on the agenda, and once it was on the agenda in terms of the public dialogue and discussion and getting to the point of it being a divisive issue, and it is a divisive issue, and then looking at Indiana, I thought it was appropriate to step up now and said, let's not have this drag out. Let, let's not be ambiguous about it. Um, we did the analysis and research just like we do on every other issue, make a decision, and move on. And I've made a decision. I believe freedom of choice for workers is an important topic. Let's get it done now. So you're willing to take on this, this addition even though it could divide business and labor? It was already on the table, and this is not an issue between business and labor. If, again, if you look at this has nothing to do with the relationship between a union and a business. This is not collective bargaining. This is about an issue between workers, hardworking Michigan workers, and the unions that are involved in their organizations. And this is an opportunity to say, shouldn't those people have an opportunity to choose? It does nothing to say the union should be in trouble or have other challenges. It just means the union should be fairly presenting their case and get people excited why it's a great place to join, just as we heard from these fine people here. They're happy to belong to a union. They made that choice because um, they, made, they want a decision, though, in the future to say, let's get better accountability from the people presenting that case to them. Yeah. Give them a right. choice. Thank you. And I think we'll switch sides to the table here. John, Associated Press. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if you could give us more detail about exactly what the legislation will say and when it will be introduced. Um, I think you're going to see bills get introduced today. Um, I would leave it to um, my colleagues that are the experts. I don't interfere in the legislative process. I've learned that from a long time ago. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Maybe some commentary. <laughs> but I'll, I'll ask them if they would like to make comments. But the idea is the bills would be introduced today and hopefully um, get done in a timely fashion before they leave um, session. Yeah. yeah, none of these are, are new issues. They've been talked about, they've been debated for a long time. So I would, I would expect that things would move relatively quickly. Uh, can you tell us what, what exactly are they going to say? Well, basically, you have a freedom in the public sector with the carve out, as, as was mentioned, for Public Act 312 employees. And the private sector would be the same thing. You have a willing, a willing uh, uh, choice there to make whether you want to be a, a member of the union or not. It's pretty straightforward, but legal people have been working on the right language for several different options, depending on what the caucuses and the governor decided to do. So um, uh, the details and the legalese I won't get into, but in general, that's what they do. Mr. Speaker, did you want to address? I would just, you'll have access to the detailed language today. Thank you. All right, Karen, did you uh, Yes, I'm wondering whether or not, other than the police and fire personnel, um, all public and private uh, 
uh, workers would be included in this carve out in this right to work legislation. Uh, the, the, the legislation itself will cover all employees except police and fire for 312. All right, thank you. We'll do some, uh, Mr. Pluto, Michigan Public Radio Network. Um, the, will the legislation have appropriations? Labor law has a long history in this state of requiring implementation and requiring dollars to be spent to make sure that workers are aware of their rights and their rights are protected. So I expect that to be part of it. All right. Uh, Jim? Over here, Jim Gerson, Channel 7 out of Detroit. Since all of you are here, uh, do you have the votes? Uh, is the legislative session extended to run through this weekend? What is your best timetable to have this completed? Are you confident you have the votes in both chambers that you'll put the right bill on the desk of the governor that he will sign? Can you inform the state how quickly this will be done and signed into law? That's my specific question. Yeah, well, we always open. We're always open for debate, and there will be debate, I'm sure, uh, on the floor. Um, so, when the debate's finished, we'll have the votes. Do I believe I have the votes? I have talked specifically one-on-one -on -one with every member of the Senate, and uh, I do believe that the votes are there to pass what they've been talking about so far. But the debate will be open, and uh, I would anticipate something happens before the end of the calendar year, for sure. I would, I would echo those comments. Uh, I'm here because I believe we have the votes, uh, the commitments for the votes. Uh, the legislative process will be respected. The debate will be welcomed. Uh, this debate has been ongoing in Michigan for decades, uh, and specifically in this legislature for two years now. Uh, so that, that process will continue. Uh, we have, and you may be referencing, the House has posted session dates for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Uh, those are if necessary. Uh, we're gonna take this issue very seriously and work it through very appropriately. So just by way of follow up, is it your intent to move it through the process this weekend and have it done by next Monday, or is it a looser schedule by the end of the year? By the end of the year is what I'm willing to say today uh, because I don't wanna predetermine the legislative process. Thank you, and again, just a reminder for our media on the phone, you need to press zero to get into the queue, and we will switch momentarily over there. Um, hang on one second. Um, Chris Bloomberg. You can talk to you not to use me now. The point here is you don't have, you wouldn't be required to pay any money at all to support the union. Is that right? Is that supporting the business? You have to pay a fee of so about 85% if you don't want to be, and then have none of the membership. Um, and you don't have to do that anymore. That's correct. Right. Kyle Merce. Thank you. Uh, Kyle Mullen from Merce. Um, for the legislative leaders and for the governor, can you talk about the influence that um, uh, you guys have received from um, contributors, Dick DeVos um, and um, Ron Weiser and other contributors to the Republican parties? I know they've been calling legislators and, and urging them to go in this direction. Can you guys talk about their influence in this? You'd ask the legislature? There are, all, there are all sorts of people who give us uh, advice, who give us input, and that comes from both sides of this equation. They've been present here at the Capitol. They've been calling our offices. Again, people advocating on both sides. I'll tell you what has bothered me. It has bothered me to watch my Democrat colleagues call the workers of Michigan freeloaders. That's offensive. None of the people sitting up here or sitting over there who go to work every day should ever be referred to as a freeloader. This is about their rights. This is about the future of our state. Yeah, to put it in context, Kyle, most of my time has been spent talking to labor leaders. And I actually want to say thank you to a number of labor leaders because, again, this issue had gotten on the table, on the agenda, and there were a lot of thoughtful talks going on that were constructive discussions about how to build better relations longer term. Obviously, part of their goal was not to see this happen, but I appreciate it. I thought it was a well-done, thoughtful discussion between lots of people um, from unions um, talking to legislators, and there are a lot of people involved in this discussion. But I, I want to give a special thank you to them because it was done in a thoughtful, respectful way, and I hope we continue relationships in that regard because this is not being it anti-union. This is about supporting collective bargaining, organizing, but giving workers choice. Can I, I can make a very definitive statement. I have met more with Bob King on this issue than I've met with either Dick DeBoss or Ron Weiser. It seemed like you had a lot of influence with it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Did I see one question over here? Nora with uh, BNA. 
Hi, uh, you talked about Indiana, and can you give any kind of uh, data on the quality of the jobs? I know companies have announced expansion plans, but. Yeah, th no, these are good jobs. And what we'll be happy to do is, is this is public information that will share some of the information from Indiana, but I encourage you to contact the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. These are significant employment opportunities with good jobs. Thank you. I think it's that John from Governor down here. Hi, John Lundstrom from Governor. Of the companies that you talked to, have any of them said, you and act the right to work law in the state, we will locate you? What I had said, because again, most of the discussions I got previously is to say, since you're not a right to work state, we're not looking at your state. They didn't say you've done the right to work state, we will look at you, we'll locate Again, the time frame I was talking to them, we weren't, so they weren't even considering us when I would ask them to add us to the list. Right, great, okay, Karen. There was some talk earlier that um, you, that the governor's office was in negotiation with some of the unions to try to come to some kind of compromise. Was there any compromise included in this legislation or any kind of um, concession given to the unions in terms of other legislation or um, the way that this particular act will be written? No, this was really a discussion about the long-term relationship to say how do we work together? Because again, the goal here isn't to divide Michigan, it's to bring Michiganders together. And I know that's a difficult statement in this circumstance, but I hope as we get through this difficult time, people will come together to recognize that unions, as they present the best case to their workers, workers have now better choice. Um, they can be successful, the workers can be more successful, unions can be more successful, and we can win. But there was not a discussion of, you know, this vote, that vote, particular terms. We had a good general discussion about strategic relationships, where the future of the state's going. Okay, was the, the carve out for the state police and firefighters and police officers, was that something that was uh, done um, because of an agreement with those particular unions? I think it's important to note that that's based on the Constitution and current law. In public act? Public Act 312 and the constitutional provisions with regard to the state police. Okay. Public Act 312 provides binding arbitration for police and fire so that, the that we don't compromise safety to the citizens in some kind of negotiation. So it was important to keep those groups together is what we thought. Right. There is one other thing too. Yeah, that was my, 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 my legislation a long time ago. But there's one other thing you should know that, and this is a little bit complicated, so I'll try to simplify it. We don't intend to act for immediate effect on these bills. So in other words, there will be a 90-day time frame from the end of this year when they're still, um, they, they won't go into effect. And I hope that what we've done is create an atmosphere of continuing a dialogue about the workplace and things that we might do to improve the workplace. 1099 reform, things like that that are out there uh, that we haven't addressed, I think goes back to what the governor says. There were a lot of things on our agenda. Um, we got to a certain point. There's still a lot more things, and I would like to invite the labor leaders, I hope, and the other side of the aisle to be involved in those discussions. All right. Thank you. We actually, we have, it turns out almost all of our callers are actually listeners today. So we're double checking just one more time to make sure nobody on the phone has a question. But Chris, great. Uh, the comment was made that, that Bob King has been in more discussions with you than Ron Weiser or Dick DeVos, but it was Dick and Ron that got what they want, not Bob King. So what did talking get you in these last few weeks? What I was looking for from all of my conversations, no matter who it was with, was what was best for Michigan's workers, what was going to be best for our kids and our grandkids' opportunities in this state. I don't yet have grandkids. I've got growing teenagers. Uh, but I want to have those grandkids be raised here in Michigan because they found those opportunities here in Michigan. So it didn't matter who I was talking to. My focus were the men and women who are sitting with us here and are joining us here and the hard work they do every day. And so all of those conversations, it was not a negotiation of trades. This was not a Republican versus Democrat. This was, the focus was, what's best for our citizens, what's best for our workers. So police and fire didn't get a carve out because they supported personal property We're tax. maintaining, the police and fire is not a carve out. 
that we're maintaining their treatment under Public Act 312 for the mentions or the reasons that have been mentioned, binding arbitration, and we're, we're respecting the Constitution with regard to the state police. So I reject that it's a carve out. I say that we're maintaining that treatment. And I'll, right. I'll add that police, police and fire likely supported the personal property tax reform because we viewed it as an essential service and guaranteed 100% support for those entities going forward. That was the critical uh, aspect of the plan that drew their support. All right, I think we've got Kristen with the Lansing State Journal right here, and then we'll do Dave at MLive, and then I know you guys need to get to session, and we are going to scoot out, and we and our workers over here will be available for questions for everyone as well, too. So, Kristen? Governor, can you say which specific firms said they weren't going to locate here because of the labor environment? No, I want to respect that, because, again, they're, they're businesses, and... Uh, Again, that can create certain issues and challenges to their business, to mention that, so I don't think that's appropriate. All right, great. Dave, you're the last question. Governor, given the magnitude of this issue, do you think there should be legislative hearings? Well, I'd actually uh, encourage if either the speaker or majority leader want to add, but this topic's been out there for a significant amount of time. I mean, there's been <laughs> bills on this topic for months out there. There's been a lot of dialogue and discussion. I think it's a well-understood issue. Again, I don't need to make that decision. It's really the legislators, when the bills come in, if they're comfortable with that, I support them in that. And I support that exact comment. Uh, this issue has been discussed in this session for almost two years now. It's been discussed in Michigan for decades now. Uh, we will have that debate in the legislative process. Uh, and I will, you're, you're allowing me to branch into those who have raised political concerns over what may or may not have happened over the last six months or a year. If you remember, I first raised this issue two years ago. We've been talking about this issue in this session for two years. My point is, well before any of the politics people wish to suppose might have influenced. The focus two years ago and the focus today is on Michigan workers. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.